so many. That, that. Oh, really? I thought you said you had a couple. A couple comments, not a couple sets of comments. Oh, okay. Um, all right, well, listen, I'm sure we'll get back to Ukraine in a, a, a second, but I just want to start to see if we can clear up what's going on with um, Private Travis in North Korea. Ha has there been any contact between uh, either the U.S. or the U.N. command and North Korea about his situation? Let me take them maybe in reverse order of the way you asked them. I saw the reports uh, about contact between the U.N. command and North Korea. Um, uh, it is my understanding that there have been no new communications since last week, uh, communications that happened in the early days. I think the reports may have uh, uh, resulted from a misinterpretation of the UN Command's original statement, but I will leave it to them to, to discuss the details of that, but I'm not aware of any new communications other than those that happened in the very early hours or early days after he went across the border. Um, well, okay, and just on that, and those were all one way, right? Those were from the UN command or the US to the North Koreans. There's, in other words, there has been, For you're the, not aware of any response on the U, on, anyone. On the UN side, the my understanding is that the North Koreans acknowledge they received the message. I'll let you decide whether that constitutes an actual response or not. They acknowledge that they received the message. Uh, on our side, um, as I said last week, we have a number of channels through which we we're able to send messages to them. We've delivered the messages to North Korea, but we have as yet not received a response. And is that uh, just the civilian side, or is that also your understanding of the military? Uh, my, my understanding is both sides. We haven't received any response. Oh, all right. Yes. Jenny, go ahead. Thank you. I have the North Korean issues uh, uh, between uh, Union Command and North Korea conversations. Can you tell uh, what the North Korea demand from the U.S. in to the situation private things? We have not had any substantive uh, communications with North Korea. We have. We have um, uh, made outreach to North Korea to let them know that uh, we wanted to ascertain the whereabouts of Private Keen. We wanted information about his safety, um, but we have not received any response from them at all. Will the U.S. pay North Korea for King to come back home? Uh, I don't have any updates. I think it would be uh, irresponsible for me to speculate about what might happen down the road when we have not yet even learned of his whereabouts, of his status, of his safety, uh, uh, or, or heard really any substantive response from the North Korean side. Notifications. Last weekend, North Korea fired cruise missile capable of carrying a tactical nuclear warhead. Also, another uh, ballistic missile fired this morning. How to respond to North Korea's series of provocations on the seventh anniversary of Armistice? We would once again urge the DPRK to refrain from escalatory actions. We remain committed to diplomacy and reiterate our interest in dialogue with North Korea without preconditions, but uh, as is the case in our communications um, uh, with respect to Private King, we have made our position clear and uh, have not received a, uh, any kind of substantive response from North Korea. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can we stay in North Korea? So earlier today, North Korea has fired a ballistic missile into North Korea of its east coast. Do you have anything on that? Yeah, um, uh, we've see, uh, seen the reports. Uh, I will say that um, once again, as happened, as we said with respect to previous ballistic missile launches by North Korea, those launches are in violation of multiple UN Security Council resolutions, and uh, we condemn them and would urge uh, North Korea to refrain from such escalatory actions. Can you provide more detail on the upcoming U.S.-Japan-South Korea leader summit next month? Uh, I do not have any announcements in that regard. Secretary uh, Shulman spoke to her counterparts uh, on the trilateral partnership, and then in your in a readout that you, you <coughs> excuse me you issued earlier today, you said that most officials work on the upcoming summit. Um, is it going to be held next month, August 18, uh, in Kansas City? I'm just just um, I'm not in a position to make any announcements around details at this point. Uh, you said the you you and Pitao of these issues and those clear military violation. But you haven't done really anything since it's a long time. Did they, did, you know, just people are just because of China and 
brush I have with Vito, uh, use Vito etches. So how did you expect the UN Security Council to take care of it, you know, uh, this issue? You were right about the makeup of the UN Security Council. Uh, all I was, will say is that we will continue to work with our partners in the region as we have with South Korea and Japan. Uh, we will continue to urge D D the DPRK to refrain from escalatory action. We would certainly welcome China uh, participating as a, a positive force in this regard. We've not seen that um, uh, for some time. We would welcome a change of heart on their mind. And in the meantime, we will continue to make our policy clear and urge the DPRK to refrain from escalatory actions. Uh, sorry. People <laughs> aren't raising their hands anymore. Yeah. We're just, we're just doing this too. Go, this, go ahead, last one, then I'm going to move yeah. on. Is this still a U.S. estimation that North Korea will conduct its seventh nuclear test soon? And how concerned is the United States? Uh, we would obviously be concerned with any nuclear test, but I don't want to make any, any assessments from here. Alex, go ahead. Welcome back, Alex. Thank you so much. Uh, since I deserve multiple questions. You ask multiple questions whether I whether you deserve them or not, so I don't know if there's much I can do about it. Thanks so much. The readout of uh, the Secretary's call to uh, Romania uh, colleagues did not mention uh, overnight rushes like uh, near Romania, which happened to be the first one uh, near NATO territory since the war began. What is your level of concern and what steps are you guys going to take to, uh, to push up the Romanian uh, security in the region? Well, I will say that since the outset of this conflict, we have made one clear we have made clear one principle with respect to our NATO partners, and we will continue to reiterate, and that is that we will defend every inch of NATO territory. Uh, the Secretary made that clear in his call with the Romanian Foreign Minister today. The President has made that clear on a number of occasions, and it continues to be um, one of our fundamental bedrock principles. I want to shift to something as we discussed uh, two various days ago offside with you, uh, which is about uh, Russia, the American companies operating in, in Russia. Um, you did come up with sanctions last week, but uh, you're still lacking with uh, business advisory uh, to American companies. There are more than, uh, well, I don't know, the president, 600 companies left, but uh, that goes out because of this against what we have heard from this podium in February that thousand companies have left. There are compelling uh, you know, reports indicating that. Uh, most of them have uh, you know, changed their promises and stayed there. They profited about 40 million in Russia and you know, paid taxes, aka supported Putin's uh, war efforts. Uh, what's the progress going to take uh, to prevent this from happening? I won't preview any steps uh, that we may or may not take uh, down the road. That's true all, with respect to all of our sanctions actions or enforcement actions, but we, I, I will make clear, as we have, that um, uh, we would oppose any company, any individual that, that uh, helps the Russian Federation profit off of this war or takes actions that would uh, benefit the Russian government's prosecution of this war. We have imposed a number of sanctions in that regard. We continue to impose new sanctions, as you said, as recently as last week, and we will continue to look for ways to tighten uh, the enforcement of those sanctions. Well, Matt, today marks uh, 17 months of this brutal war. You have no problem that there are still American companies are operating in Russia, earning money, and funding Putin. I, I don't have anything to add other than what I just said. Uh, please come back to me later. I won't be uh, respecting yeah, my go ahead. Staying on uh, Russia and Ukraine, I wanted just to come back to the to the call, uh, secretary call with the Romanian the Romanian counterpart. Um, did, did they kind of agree or, or or just have any specific discussions about this these attacks on the Danube? You know, it's not just uh, on the issue of Article Five, as you said, but um, you know this is obviously very close to the border, and as you said. The, Potentially interrupting gra grain export routes from, from Ukraine. So, is there like a specific message that the, the Secretary and the Romanian counterpart um, uh, you know, agreed and, and that you, you want to sort of convey to, to the Russians? They did discuss the issue as well as the, bro the, blo the broader, excuse me, getting broader and black together, uh, the broader Black Sea Grain Initiative. Um, and uh, the Secretary made clear that he would welcome uh, Romania's support as they w would welcome the support of all of our uh, allies and partners in the region in finding ways to restart the Black Sea Grain Initiative. As you know, um, Pre President Erdogan said on Friday that he looked to 
um, have further discussions with President Putin to urge him to rejoin the Black Sea Grain Initiative. Uh, we um, obviously would be hopeful that there would be some success out of those discussions, but we're also mindful of the series of events since last week when Russia pull pulled out of the initiative that, that I you know, outlined in my opening comments. Uh, four or five days of repeated attacks on Odessa, uh, Russia staging, uh, uh, or I should say, Russia holding a practice assault on a mock ship in the Black Sea last week. Um, uh, we've had information to suggest that they may be preparing a false flag operation. We believe they may be preparing a false flag operation. They're threatening of, of, of ships operating in international waters. And then just today, this attack on the Danube. So we will continue to consult with our partners in the region uh, on how we might find alternative ways to get uh, uh, grain out of Ukraine but recognizing that there is no, no perfect solution that would allow Ukraine to ship the same amount of grain as it did uh, under the Black Sea Grain Initiative without the open, reopening of those sea lanes. There just simply isn't a way to get the, enough grain out through the Danube ports or over land or any other means. Okay. That's it for uh, Well, I just, are you suggesting that these attacks on the Danube were a false flag operation? No, no, that's not what I said. No, no, no. I was, I was going through, we believe oh. there may be a false flag operation, oh, right. but th have that's not seen, what this was. This, I, was, I, this I, was an I, attack. Have there been any? No, no. There have been attacks by Russians. I'm discussing attacks. Uh, are you aware of there being false no. flag attacks? No, we are, we, what we believe, have information that leads us to believe Russia may conduct a false flag attack that they blame yeah, on the Ukrainians. They, they, they had a long exchange with your predecessor. I, re I, I, about, I remember, uh, I remember uh, that well. Have you seen any evidence that they have done? They have not. We're concerned they may in the future. Okay, well, you know, you're concerned about a lot of things. We are. I can, we, can, you, can, can, can you explain why you're concerned that there, there uh, might be such a... Uh, we I, have, I'm not saying there won't be. I'm just... I, we have, inf know, we have information that leads us to believe they may. And I'm what not at liberty to say any more than that. Uh, I am uh, uh, unable to, to, to get further into that information for reasons I think you understand. Uh, we have, have declassified certain intelligence and made it public. Um, I, I will say, I, I understand, I, I understand, I really don't want to relitigate from no, things from a year ago. I don't but, but I will say, either, our, our, but, you, but you keep saying this. I mean, this is by my count, at least the fourth or fifth time since this whole thing began, or even before it began, that you guys say that the Russians are going to do these false flag attacks. We and did see false flag attacks in the opening. Have, there were some in the opening days of the war, going back years you know, that, that we predicted and that did come true. I think our, our track record of declassifying information about what Russia might do has been pretty good. I, I, I'm not trying to defend Russia or anything. I'm just trying to figure out what is, why it is you guys keep coming out with saying this stuff, and then it, it doesn't. Because we, uh, I think a number of first of all, I've, a number of things that we have said would happen. Russia, in fact, did do. If you go back and look at the secretary's remarks, the to invasion the, of Ukraine was not a false flag. Attack. No, and, and, and but <laughs> but there were again. We're, no we are we are relitigating. Well, that's no, not we're not. History. It's a year ago. Don't ask. Yeah, that's what I was referring. There were there were false flag attacks that we we predicted that did happen in the opening days of the war. Sorry, yeah. But uh, I'm wondering whether to, to the Russians, uh, as you guys have been warning against it, but I guess you've seen that. Does that um, amount to what you've been warning them not to do? Um, a few things about that. Number one, we have uh, uh, focused our sanctions on lethal assistance. Uh, we do continue to monitor whether there are additional sanctions that we ought to impose, as, whether, as well as whether there are companies that are violating our sanctions. Uh, I'm not going to comment with, the, with respect to the specific report in Politico because the only information I have is what's contained in the article, which isn't to say I doubt it, but we would obviously have to conduct our own assessment before making uh, any kind of determination about whether an activity was a sanctions violation or whether we needed to impose additional sanctions in, in response to some activity that, that we've, we've seen. I will say one of the things that we made clear, uh, that Secretary Blinken made clear to Chinese government officials uh, when we were in Beijing was that, one, um, uh, we were monitoring the issue closely and would very much uh, oppose any action on the government side, the, the, the Chinese government transferring lethal assistance to Russia. And that, number two, on the private sector side, it was an issue where we had also where we also had serious concerns. We had seen companies providing assistance to Russia in the past. We had sanctioned those companies, and that we would continue to monitor it closely uh, and and take 
actions against private Chinese companies when we saw such sanctionable activity. From the government perspective, it's still the case that you haven't seen anything that, that sort of oversteps that, oversteps that. That's correct. That's correct. Yeah, go ahead. Um, CENTCOM, uh, CENTCOM chief, uh, General Michael Corella just had a meeting with Pakistani army chief and um, the press release says that the U.S. recognized continued efforts uh, and stability in the region. So I just have three questions, small one related to this. Uh, was the trip planned uh, or uh, did it just happen? Second is that Pakistan is not getting any pay. Has Pakistan gotten any payment since Afghan withdrawal for any defense-related cooperation? And lastly, did the CENTCOM chief go to smooth up, smoothen up things uh, with regard to Mr. Donald Lu? I, I, I would, I you would don't say, start with Donald Lu. Don't I, start with I, the Yeah, I, I wondered if you would get there. You always, you always do. Um, that. Uh, <laughs> I, I would refer you with respect to all three of those questions to my colleagues at the Pentagon that obviously involves a trip by a senior U.S. military official. They have a daily so briefing I'm, over there, and I would encourage you to, to I'm, I'm subject, uh, I'm ask, ask those questions to them. You are part in the story that uh, Matthew Miller had earlier last week mentioned that, you know, urged the Afghan authorities to uh, not use their land for uh, security. So I was just wondering, is the State Department aware of the trip or not? No, we were aware of the trip, but for any detailed comment, I would refer you to the Pentagon. Just last question. Yeah. Um, I know we both are sick of the same thing, but it's just both of our job is such that, you know. So today, the former uh, foreign minister of Pakistan, while speaking to media after a month of detention and back and forth, he also came out and he said the cipher was reality, the U.S. officials was giving a demarche. So now you have a former prime minister, uh, former prime minister, the military chiefs were sitting. So w is the responsibility going on President Biden wanting to change the regime in Pakistan or the secretary? I mean, one somebody has to take at least. Uh, I feel like I need to bring uh, just a sign that I can hold up in response to this question to say that that, a that allegation is not true. I don't know how many times I can say it. I will say, as I've said before, that the United States does not have a position on one political candidate or party versus another in Pakistan or in any other country. Go ahead. 14, 14 Iraqi families of a few but you have announced the sanctions from Iraq and there are some media on Iraqi, Iraqi media says that it was going to impose more sanctions on Iraqi families. Could you speak more on this new sanctions from Iraq? Uh, no, I would uh, never pre preview any sanctions actions, whether they're going to happen or not from here. Uh, last week's sanction on Iraq, you sanctioned uh, 14 banks in Iraq, but you haven't announced it. Yeah. Uh, I don't have any further comments. Okay, one question. Last Friday, Minister Sabin C, head of the uh, Department of Foreign Relations of the Kursan region, was here. He met some people at the State Department that we didn't meet with uh, Secretary Lincoln. Uh, and we haven't seen any Kurdish leaders in Washington for a long time. Could you speak about your current relations with the Kurdistan region and have you put the Kurds into the backseat in foreign policy? Uh, absolutely not. It continues to be uh, an issue on which we are very much engaged. We've had a number of conversations both with Kurdish leaders and with other leader leaders in the region uh, about it and it is something we will continue to stay focused on. One last question. Yeah. The, 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 the Kurdistan region, the Kurdistan region here faces a big challenge with providing and uh, with paying the monthly salary this to their public servants. And this is due to the carriage of expropriation also disputes with uh, revenue share just like that. How does the US use this disputes between the deal and the Yeah, I'll have to take that one back. Reaction to uh, the Knesset's vote today. And secondly, also in Israel that's slightly different. Why could you explain why under the uh, US waiver MOU with Israel that Gazan Americans have been excluded? Uh, let me take that one. Uh, let, let me let me take that one first. I will say that it is our understanding and our expectation that the visa waiver program will apply to all Americans, including Americans in Gaza. Uh, we believe that um, uh, Israel is going to update its policies. That, that uh, uh, the 
regulations that they rolled out next last month or last week, I should say, will be uh, updated in the coming weeks. And it is our expectation that it will apply to all Americans. Now, there may be slightly different procedures for Americans who live in Gaza because of the different security situation that exists there. Um, but we expect the, the program to apply to all Americans and we'll be monitoring Israel's compliance with that quite closely. Uh, with respect to the vote in the Knesset today, um, as we've said before, as a lifelong friend of Israel, President Biden has publicly and privately expressed his views that major changes in a democracy should be, if they're going to be enduring, must have as broad a consensus as possible. It was unfortunate that the vote today took place with the slimmest possible majority. We understand talks are ongoing and likely to continue over the coming weeks and months to forge a broader compromise, even with the Knesset in recess, and we will continue to support the efforts of President Herzog and other Israeli leaders as they seek to build a broader consensus through political dialogue. Follow up? Go ahead. Go ahead, but I will say I do always appreciate when uh, the, the yelling the question before I've called on you is the, the is more likely to have me call on someone else, but go ahead for, oh, for today. Okay. Well, anyway, uh, while the State Department has indeed called on the Palestinian Authority to stop payments for murder of Jews in accordance with the Taylor Force Act, why will the State Department not demand that the Palestinian Authority repeal, uh, repeal the law and um, uh, Further, further here, uh, why would they would not demand that the Palestinian Authority repeal the law that mandates a salary for life for anyone who murders a Jew and not make them repeal this law a condition for renewed U.S. aid to the Palestinian Authority? And I have a follow-up. Uh, I will say that we have made very clear um, uh, that we um, uh, oppose um, escalatory actions, that we oppose violence against anyone, whether they be Israeli or Palestinian, and that Israel has a right to defend itself. Okay, the Jerusalem Post reports on July 15th of this year that Palestinian Authority President Mohammed Abbas is seeking to form a unity government with Hamas, being that Hamas is a genocidal terrorist organization. What is your elaborated response to the Palestinian Arab leadership that wants to embrace Hamas? Uh, we have made clay, quite clear our feelings about Hamas as a designated terrorist organization. I don't think I need to elaborate on that any further. Go ahead. Thank you, Matt. On Cambodian election, you said Sunday is neither free nor fair. So, and you impose visa restrictions. So, would you please a little bit elaborate that who will be the under this visa restriction? Obviously, it was not an election, it was a sort of selection. Obviously, the uh, visa, I didn't understand. Obviously. So, you, you, I heard the first part, yeah, I just didn't catch the last one. So, who will be the under this visa restriction? The Cambodian current regime leadership. Uh, we do not make we do not make those designations public. We make de public that we have de that we have designated officials, um, but we do not make the names public as a matter of policy. Okay. On two on on Bangladesh, if I may, countrywide massive protests going on in Bangladesh. Regime is attacking on opposition peaceful rallies where tens of thousands of people demanding ruling prime minister. Internet shutdown in opposition rallies, including cell phone checking, arrest and filing thousands of cases ag against opposition leaders and workers. Even deceased opposition leaders are not spared by the current regime. So will U.S. imply the visa restriction those who are undermining democratic process and human rights in Bangladesh? So as a policy, we don't preview visa restrictions any more than we pre preview any other sanctions actions, as I said in response to questions about other sanction authorities previously in this briefing. But as Secretary Blinken made clear when he issued the policy on May 24th, uh, these visa restrictions would apply to anyone who undermines the democratic election process in Bangladesh. Actions that constitute undermining the democratic election process include vote rigging, voter intimidation, the use of violence to prevent people from exercising their rights to freedom of association and peaceful assembly, and the use of measures designed to prevent political parties, voters, civil society, or the media from disseminating their views. Yeah, in Bangladesh, human rights defenders are being subject to threats, harassment, and prosecution from state and non-state actors. According to recent reports of the Center for Governance Studies, 86% human rights defender, defenders face various obstructions. Obstacles. Funds control is another weapon in government hands as the regulatory body NGO Affairs Bureau is under Prime Minister's office. So many international aid recipients organizations have been affected. Right workers are not getting their paychecks, as I heard from the ground. Do you think it is concerning for the US as the largest development partner in Bangladesh? 
I would say that we, um, uh, as a general rule, support everyone's ability to um, freely exercise their role in a democratic society. We oppose any restrictions on human rights, and I don't have any further specific comments on that. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, just, just to follow up on the Cambodia statement that you put out yesterday, you said that the clause in certain foreign assistance programs didn't specify uh, which programs or at least what kind of areas they are. Um, they are, um, uh, I can't detail the specific programs. Uh, we have communicated that directly to the Cambodian government, but I can say it, uh, the, the amount total is $18 million in this fiscal year, and that it, the restrictions will extend into future fiscal years as well. 18 one eight. Uh, one eight, yes. Yeah. It's a serious amount of money, uh, both this year and in coming fiscal and, years. And any particular areas? There are, you know, the, obviously there's like diff different humanitarian assistance, um, the assistance that you give to to like political well NGOs and those kind of things is there, are there any specific type that you I don't have any further details about them but we can follow up afterwards maybe USA can can provide further details sure and another another follow up the the Prime Minister since you sort of said these elections are made free free or fair Prime Minister Hun Sen has um, said his son Hun Manet is likely to take power in, in coming days do you have a sort of coming weeks do you have a specific response uh, to to that potential event? Only that we were troubled that the elections themselves were neither free or fair, as we said, that um, Cambodia, Cambodian authorities engage in a pattern of threats and harassment against the uh, political opposition throughout the electoral process, denied the Cambodian people a voice and choice in determining their future of the country. Uh, I don't have anything further than that. Uh, it's a little bit backward looking, but Han Manet is actually a, a West Point grad under a DOD slash State Department program that brings in uh, cadets to, to West Point. Uh, I wonder if there's any way that you, you know, any, the fact that he, he might become the, the, the leader of a country through clearly undemocratic means uh, would prompt you to, uh, to, to review that program that, that allows, you know, to uh, allowing the son of the prime minister to come and study at uh, the elite military uh, institution in this country. Um, you know, is that something that you would want to try and avoid happening in the future? I, I'm not aware of any reviews of the program that we will be undertaking. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask about reporting that the United States is weighing a possible deal with China on fentanyl, that the administration is considering lifting sanctions on a police forensics institute uh, around human rights abuses in exchange for Beijing's cooperation combating the fentanyl crisis. I was wondering if you could speak to that and what the administration, uh, if not this, what else they're doing uh, on fentanyl. We have not had any such discussions with Beijing. Uh, in fact, we have made quite clear to the Chinese government that we do not believe that the sanctions are in place prevent the defense minister from uh, meeting with our secretary of defense when we have made it clear that we think it is irresponsible to continue to uh, not conduct military to military cooperation. It's a position that we just, not just the State Department has made clear, but of course the Defense Department and the White House have, have made clear as well. Uh, on fentanyl, the, the secretary made clear both in his trip to Beijing and in his recent meeting with Wang Yi that we should establish a working group. Uh, Chinese officials did give us some positive signals that they would move in that direction. It's yet to be finalized, but we do believe we should formalize a working group between our two countries to, to, to work on stopping the flow of precursor chemicals from China to Mexico, where they're then turned into fentanyl that has killed millions and millions of Americans and continues to kill Americans to this day. So just to clarify, the lifting of human rights abuses-related sanctions related to fentanyl cooperation, that's not something that's been on the table? It's not something we've discussed with the, the Chinese government, no. Um, and then just uh, another question on uh, Israel and the reaction to the, the judicial changes. What, um, if any, uh, kind of consequences of in reaction to this, uh, you know, the U.S. has been outspoken against it, could this result in, you know, uh, potential uh, negative repercussions between the U.S. and Israel over this? I would say that we have a long-standing uh, friendship with the government of Israel that really transcends any one issue. And it is because of our friendship with the government of Israel and our friendship with the people of Israel that the president and other members of this administration felt the responsibility to speak out about this measure and this measure and express our concern. So we will continue to engage with the government of Israel um, about the uh, uh, other uh, pending legislation uh, in the, the coming weeks. 
Um, uh, but I, I, rather than think about this in terms of consequences to our relationship, we think of our relationship as one in which we have areas where we disagree and we cooperate and there are areas where we do not hesitate to express concerns. Are you concerned about the, dis the, the backsliding of democracy as this could indicate a process of democracy? <laughs>seems to be happy with the waivers that the U.S. has issued for Iraq to pay its debt to that country. Today, your Iranian counterpart um, named Oman and Qatar as the third party country that where the money is going to be sent under last week's um, waiver. Can you confirm that, that that's going to Oman? I can confirm that, that um, uh, Oman has indicated a willingness to receive a portion of the, those, these funds, and we expect that to happen. Uh, we believe that is an important step. As we've said for some time, we thought it was important to get this money out of Iraq because it is a source of leverage that Iran uses. Um, uh, uh, uses against its neighbor. So th this money will be held uh, in a fund or a, an account in Iraq, but will then still be subject to the same restrictions that, that were in place with uh, Oman, excuse me, in, in Oman, but will still be subject to the same restrictions as um, uh, when the money was held in accounts in Iraq, meaning that it, the money can only be used for non-sanctionable activities such as humanitarian assistance and that all the transactions need to be approved by the United States Treasury Department in advance. Okay, on the prisoner exchange issue, again, your Iranian counterpart blamed the U.S. for elongation of this process. What has been and is the main obstacle in getting this process finalized, getting the detainees back home? Um, I'm not going to speak to the details of this process, as I have never been willing to do, just because we think it's important to keep those details um, up, uh, private. It's obviously a very sensitive matter with respect to these detainees. But I will say there is certainly nothing more than we would like that we there's nothing that we would like more than to get those detainees home as soon as possible. Uh, we are working as expeditiously as we can to make that to make that happen. We want to happen it to happen more quickly, not less quickly. And beyond that, I wouldn't want to talk about any of the underlying details. And the last one today, um, there's this e-commerce company in Iran called Digital uh, Digicala. Um, it was shut down yesterday because some pictures of a woman without the uh, mandatory scarf or head covering was uh, uh, released online. Any comments? Uh, and, and the case has, the company has been referred to the judicial system. Yeah, we've seen the reports that Iranian authorities have closed the offices of Digicala over photographs of employees purportedly not wearing uh, a mandatory hijab. Uh, we believe the targeting of Digica sends a clear message to the young people of Iran. The regime will stop at nothing to control the women and girls of Iran. The regime is even willing to suffocate its own uh, local startup companies to that end. Behavior such as that has an incredibly negative effect on the outlook for Iran's aspiring entrepreneurs. And it is no wonder that so many young people in Iran are calling for change or leaving the country. Is that all? I thought, I thought there were going to be more. You well, said multiple. three, multiple. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> How concerned is the U.S. with Lukashenko's comments about Wagner forces wanting to invade Poland? Uh, I will say it's a, it is um, another in a series of irresponsible comments by Lukashenko. Um, and the only thing I will, I will reiterate, as I said about another matter uh, earlier in this briefing, the United States uh, will defend every inch of NATO territory. Yeah, yeah so because... Uh, not just Lukashenko made comments about Poland, but also Putin, who warned that um, you know, attack on Belarus from Poland somehow would be an attack on Russia. And also, he made some comments about um, you know uh, how Poland's western lands are a gift from Stalin. 
uh, do you see this as some, you know, some kind of orchestrated thing? Do you, how do you uh, see those comments? Uh, should we read? I don't know how much you should read into them. I would say that um, there is only one country in the, in the region that has demonstrated uh, the the, not only the intent, but the willingness to invade its neighbors, and that's Russia, not Poland, not any other, com uh, in any other country in the region. And so I would just reiterate that uh, our alliance with Poland is strong. Uh, uh, Poland is a, a, um, uh, a NATO member, of course, and we will defend, if necessary, every inch of NATO territory. Yeah. The Secretary of State said Russia has already lost war in Ukraine and Kiev has already retaken about 50% of the territory seized by Russia. He also maintained that uh, the Ukraine counter offensive is still in its relatively early days. But on the same day, the Russian president asserted that Ukraine's counter offensive failed. Um, how successful do you think Ukraine's counter offensive has been so far? Um, let me step back and without, say without respect to this counteroffensive. Um, that's right, Russia, uh, Ukraine has already regained, you know, defense. If you look at um, uh, the, the, if you include Crimea, it's somewhere, Ukraine has regained somewhere around 45% of its territory. Um, if you look at, at the post-2014, not including Crimea, it's somewhere around 61% of its territory since the, uh, the launch of the full-scale invasion. Um, so Ukraine has already been incredibly successful in regaining territory um, that Russia had temporarily occupied. Um, with respect to the counteroffensive, I'm not going to, to um, uh, provide commentary about it from this podium. As I've said uh, in the past, we will leave that to the Ukrainian military. I will reiterate from our perspective that Ukraine has everything it needs to conduct this counteroffensive. We have supplied them with uh, uh, an enormous amount of, of military equipment, as have our allies and partners, uh, both in Europe and around the world, and we will continue to do so. You can expect further announcements of military assistance in the coming days. We will continue to st stand, stand strong with NATO as it conducts this counteroffensive. Um, how long would you like to wait to uh, I don't know. What do you mean, how long would we have to wait? We would, like, we would obviously love to get a response as soon as possible. Um, I, I don't want to, to, to say anything other than that we will continue to make our position clear to North Korea. We do have a variety of channels through which we can send them messages. I'm not going to talk about all those details because they're sensitive in a case like this. Um, but we are concerned about his safety, his well-being. We want him to be returned as soon as possible, so we will continue to work this case. And this week is going to be the 70th anniversary of Korean armistice. Um, how are you going to mark this anniversary? Are you going to take this opportunity to send North Korea any message? Uh, I, won't want, I don't want to comment on, on what we might do in the next Thank few you days. Thank you so much, Matt. Uh, After a long time, I was trying to... <laughs> in uh, 2018... There's a lot of people in the room today, so... <laughs> the Canadian Federal Court dismissed the asylum petition of an activist associated with the Bangladesh Nationalist Party, BNP, branding it as a terrorist organization. It's also worth noting that the political observer in Bangladesh say that the BNP has a history of engaging in political violence, particularly in the national election in 2014. At that time, the BNP demanded an election under a caretaker government, which was earlier ruled unconstitutional by the Supreme Court of Bangladesh. As Bangladesh approaching its next national election, the ruling party has accused the BNP of attempting to initiate violence against by advocating for the reinstatement of the unconstitutional election time government. What are you observing? Uh, my observations are that, number one, we do not take a position with respect to any political party in Bangladesh or in other countries, but that we believe that Bangladesh and all countries throughout the world should have free and fair elections. All right, I'll take... I have, I have go ahead, as a follow-up. Sure. Yeah. Uh, uh, in Bangladesh, media experts believe that the United States uses human rights issues as a tool of exert pressure on specific countries to further its own interests. They also argue that the U.S. often turns a blind eye to human rights violation 
in countries like India, Saudi Arabia, Israel, and other parts of the world. What is your perspective on this? I mean, I would note some tension in, in between the, the two questions. I would note that um, uh, I would say that we raise human rights concerns when we have human rights concerns, when we see human rights violations, and we raise those concerns not uh, with respect to countries with which we have strong partnerships and with countries uh, where the, the partnerships are much more, shall we say, challenged. All right, Alex, go ahead. And then Michelle, come to Michelle next and we'll finish up. As a journalist, another application yesterday about the Bible, they came up with some kind of charges against him. But what we do know is that he was a vocal critic of the government and the kind of cause corruption. I was singled out by the president while he was speaking here in New Jersey. Do you have any comment? Yeah, we are closely following the arrest of Gubad uh, Ibadoglu. The United States remains strongly committed to advancing respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms. We urge, the Azer uh, we urge Azerbaijan to protect the human rights and fundamental freedoms of its citizens, including Gubad uh, Ibadoglu, consistent with Ab Azerbaijan's own constitution and international obligations and commitments. Again, one more Georgia, if you don't mind. A, a group of uh, former U.S. ambassadors, five ambassadors to Georgia, issued a statement last week uh, urging the, uh, the Georgian government to uh, allow the President Saakashvili to uh, obtain life-saving medical, uh, medical treatment. Um, do you support those calls? Uh, I'll just say we are monitoring uh, Mr. Saakashvili's case closely. We are very concerned about his health. As we have said publicly and privately to the Georgian government many times, it is the government's responsibility to provide the medical care he needs to ensure his human rights are respected, uh, and we will continue to, uh, to monitor this case very closely. All right, Michelle, this will be the last one. Thank you. Uh, do you have any updates on the uh, passports, uh, backlog? Uh, do you have any figures on the applications? And uh, what's your, your reaction to the critics at the Capitol that the State Department is not doing enough? Uh, I, I will say we are, are working on this. We saw a record number of passport applications this year. Uh, we have surged resources to try and bring down the backlog. Um, uh, we are seeing some positive indications that that will happen. It was, of course, going to take some time to resolve. We had, uh, as I said, an extensive number of applications. It is a high priority for everyone in this, this administration or in this department. Please join the conversation. Put your comments and suggestions below in the comment section. Thank you for subscribing to this news channel. You will be notified of any breaking news and new post as you become part and parcel of the Macad TV family. Please like and share Macad TV. We love you all. Please support Macad TV Foundation by joining membership and visiting Amazon UK to purchase the displayed books to aid our orphanage projects across Africa.